Let's turn to Hebrews 10, verse um, 6 and 7. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. <clears throat> These two verses go together. They give the two different methods that we've been talking about here, the two ways of doing what is required. <clears throat> and I think it's important that this, this little explanation, the two ways of doing what is required, is understood. <clears throat> we got a jailbreak. Um, <clears throat> let me just read a statement here. In that Jesus knew that sacrifice and offering was not the answer for the real problem, but only an answer for a failed problem, sacrifice for sin. <clears throat> um, because sacrifice covers our lack of obedience. <clears throat> Uh, God got no pleasure out of the old method. Therefore, then, at that point, Jesus said, when the, when the way the scriptures are said, he gets no pleasure out of method one. He gets no pleasure out of sacrifices for offering of sin. Then, you could write a then in the middle line that's dividing method one and two. Then said I, and this is Jesus speaking, then said I, <clears throat> Lo, I come. Then said, I am coming, and I will do thy will, or I will be obedient, or I will do what's required. And not only that, but from the scriptures we've got in uh, um, Psalm 40, he's saying, I delight to do your will, because it's written on my heart. It's a, it's a pleasure for me to do this. This isn't... This isn't a burden. Remember that Jesus said, my, my burden easy, is easy and my, what is it, my, my, you know what it said, <clears throat> better than me apparently. <clears throat> um, it is, it was his delight. <clears throat> All right. It was within Jesus to do what God wanted. He delighted to do it. Not only that, but he had the capacity to not need sacrifice because of failure because he was sinless. And that's not just true then, folks. That's always true. Do you understand? Therefore, that can be true in us. Now you say, well, does that mean we're going we're gonna to be sinless? Probably not, but the more he increases and the more we decrease, I would say to whatever the de decrease of us is and the increase of him, that's the degree that sin will decrease in your life. Okay? Does that make sense? Why? Because of oneness. Because he's the head, we're the body, and we're joined to him. And what's true in him and his heart flows down and becomes our heart. <clears throat> him sacrificing himself for us and the failures under the first method. Uh, let's see. Okay. He sacrificed himself for us and the failures under the first method. So in that he became a sacrifice... That would remedy the problem of the old method and become the method that God always looked to as the answer or as the real, a method that God would find pleasure in. So, in other words, he became a sacrifice that, that dealt with all sin before it happened and forever would put away sin, but he did more than that. And that's usually all most Christians know, that he just died for our sins, so we don't have to worry about the sin problem. But he did more than that. He was pierced, and the piercing took away sins because he died for that, and it took away punishment because he took our punishment, but it was also a sign of being joined to this wife and kids, if you, if you remember the story in Exodus 21. And in that method, that steps over here into the new, not just dealing with the old and putting away the failures of the old, which dying for sin did. 
it brought in a whole new method. Lo, I come, a body thou hast prepared me. I delight to do thy will. Thy law is written in my heart. Does that make sense? That's, that's just perfectly a wonderful way that Hebrews is, is putting this whole thing. And that thought of the Old Testament saying, my ear you have pierced, referring to Exodus 21. The New Testament say, a body thou hast prepared me. There is no way nobody understanding the Hebrew or the Greek or, or Armenian or anything else is going to get the true meaning of that except by the Holy Spirit revealing Christ. That's why people are confused. People are confused because they don't see Jesus. <laughs> Including me in a bunch of scriptures that I have not yet seen Jesus in. I'll just make that clear right now. I got a bunch of scriptures I haven't seen the Lord in. But I've got something better than a Hebrew lexicon. I got the Holy Spirit, and so do you. Don't you? All right. Just checking. All right, so now specifically, how did this take place, which I have actually described, but I'm just going to read it. We became his body, the vehicle of his life and nature. Jesus was the servant who was born of a woman and born under the law. But he changed the whole system of how we relate to the law. We still relate to the law, but not by commandments that are, require obedience, but by Christ who fulfills the law and does that, you know, in us. Uh, he, he changed the whole system of how we relate to the law. The piercing represented the cost for failures under the first method. Now he does what he does for love of the Father and love of his newly possessed family, us. When we became pierced, or uh, when he became pierced, or at the cross, the relationship to the law was changed and he also gained a bride. I hope this is, I'm repeating now, but I hope it's understood that it is, as if Jesus is standing here under the first method. He came under the law, born of a woman. And he was a servant for seven years, if you understand what I mean. So he, seven is completion. He completed that. And when he did that, he said, sacrifice and offerings thou wouldest not. I was under the law, but you know what? It didn't take the law away by him being under it. It just put him under it with the rest of us. So as that servant who could go out free, because I'd never quoted this, but Jesus quoted it. He says, God has given me a commandment that I can lay down my life or I can take it again. I don't have to die. But he said, I love my master, my father, and I love my wife. And so he took a step. And that step was almost like he stood in between the two for a moment. And standing in between the two methods, in between the old covenant and the new, he made this statement. Sacrifice and offerings for sin thou wouldest not, you take no pleasure in. Then said I, this is him speaking, lo I come. In the volume of the book it has been written in me to do thy will. It is in my heart I delight to do that. And so at the cross, hanging between the two, he was pierced, his hands and his feet. He was pierced and he was crucified. And in doing that, he did several things. Number one, he fulfilled the punishment and all of the stuff. Most of us should know this. He died for our sins. He, he bore the punishment. He did all of that. That's what the cross, the piercing did. Okay? That's one thing. Number two, he took him a bride because when he said... I will serve by love. Well, let's let maybe before I mention the bride, we should say, he said, then come I, and he stepped over here, and when he did that, at the same time of the piercing, he stepped over there and said, I will from now on serve you, not because it's required by law, but out of love. Then that piercing represented, the, then the wife is no longer the master's. The children are no longer, they're yours. You have just gained a bride too. Do you see all three of those were taking place? And it's all represented there in Exodus 21 in the, in the full understanding of it. All right, so um, 
Because of oneness into him, she changed also and does what she does by life and love. Because of, good, oneness. Um, We are now his body. Before this, we were under the law of our schoolmaster. Right? This says the law is a schoolmaster. It's a master. Um, But now we have the law of the spirit of life at work in us. This is the law of his life at work in us. All right? All right, now verses 8 and 9. Above, when he said sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings for sin, thou wouldest not, neither hast pleasure in them which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. All right. This sounds like a repeat of verses 5 through 7. Partially it is. But if you didn't believe what he was saying in verses 5 through 7, if you didn't believe what has been explained through Exodus 21, verses uh, 8 through 9 says it straight out. This is what I'm talking about. Even though it sounds like it's a repeat, it's not a repeat. Um, uh, Neither has... Neither has pleasure in them. That's where he stopped before, and that's where the scripture stopped. But he blatantly takes it a step further with the rest of the sentence, which are offered by the law. Method number one, saying this is dealing with two different methods and how he changed from one to the other. Okay, That's why he added this time that he didn't, which are offered by the law, so that it could be without question that he's talking about this change uh, from the law to life, from the, from the old covenant to the new covenant. All right. And then verse 9, Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. And then he adds this. Even though he said that statement before, he adds this immediately behind it to show that this is what he's talking about and how he did it. Lo, I come to do thy will. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. He takes away the first method, which is the master requiring the servant to do everything he does by law, by obedience. He gets his ear pierced or gets his, you know, goes to the cross, and now he establishes the second, which is he's the head, he's the, he's the servant that serves by love, and he gained a body, and that's us, and now all that is in him is true in us. It begins to filter down. The law is written on our hearts because it was already in his heart and we're his body. We're one with him. Is this, is this making sense? I hope, I hope, I hope. All right. <clears throat> These two verses go together just as the last two did. They are similar to verses 5 and se- through 7. However, the writer will make slight changes in order to reinforce what he said before and also further establish his point. He adds that the sacrifices and offerings which God takes no pleasure in, are those that were done in accordance with the law. I just said all this, but I'm reading. All the obedience that a child gives, though not in his heart, will not please a father. In other words, you can tell a kid to do something, and he might obey, but it's not in his heart. He's just doing it because he's under the law, and he's afraid he's going to get in trouble. Does not please a father. He wants it to be in his heart. He wants to, his child to respond properly. Parents. Can I get amen? Uh, notice I said, can I get an amen, not can I get obedience or that kind of spirit in your kids, because that may not happen for a while. But <clears throat> All right. The point also is that God does not like sacrifice and offerings in general. Uh, the point is that God does not, I think I wrote this different, does not dislike sacrifice and offering in general. He is only opposed to shadow offerings that have no effect. And here's what I mean. He's not opposed to the offerings in general in the sense that if Jesus is the fulfillment, he's not opposed to him dying for sin. He's also not opposed to sacrifice and offerings in general if they are sweet savor offerings because that same thing will happen through his body. If he's that way, we will be that way. If he's self-giving, we will be self-giving. The only way you're going to be truly self-giving in the right way is by oneness, by this method, right? I mean, this is it. Oneness with Christ is our only hope. Um, 
Jesus is sacrificial in the way he lives. The old method sacrifice the old method sacrifices are just a shadow. They look like the original, but they have no power to do anything. That's the point of verse 8, which says, above when he said sacrifice and offerings and burnt offerings are for sin, thou wouldest not, neither has pleasure in them which are offered by the law. Um, verse 9 also has a partial repeat, but adds a very important sentence that proves that the line which he has been following is one of the failure of one method and the establishing of a completely new method. He taketh away the first that he might establish the second. Therefore, the Lord's response to the ineffectiveness of the first method by suggesting, uh, is, is suggesting the introduction of a completely new method described as, I will come. Now we may not see that when we read Hebrews 10 in the past. We may just see, Okay, he didn't like this, but he says, I'm going to come. Okay, well, good. If you come and you just do everything right, that doesn't change us. Right? But thy ear thou hast opened, a body thou hast required. It requires a body for this to happen to us. What is true of him is wonderful. But where's our connection? And that's what we're finding here. That's what we're digging for. We must see our connection or we're just listening to facts and talk and everything else. And I'm telling you, this stuff is incredible. I may not be able to explain it as well, but it's incredible what the Lord did. <clears throat> and remember, in uh, Psalm 40, he said, oh, man, the wonder of the, gra the greatness of what he has done for us. You remember that? Verse 5 there in, uh, in Psalm 40 where he's just going, he's just going on and on about, I, if I tried to add them up in number, I couldn't do it. This is what he's talking about. The, he went and he had his ear pierced and he, he died and he brought us in by oneness and the body was what he really was after the whole time. And, and Ephesians says, this was a mystery that was hid from generations, folks. <laughs> We're getting in on it. I love this. All right. Um, uh, so he, he brings in a new method by saying I will come he finishes off the concept with I will do and fulfill what it is that you have always wanted and the thing that you will take pleasure in the beloved son makes God well pleased the writer brings home the point with he taketh away the first the shadow method that he may establish the second the true method God had in mind all along which is Oneness into the life of Christ. All right, verse 10. <clears throat> By which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Now, if oneness with Jesus is not the answer and the new method being introduced and also being the new method introduced, then we would not have verse 10 and 14 through 18. Um, let's go ahead and read 14. And, and by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified and the Holy Spirit also is a witness to us, for after he said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws <gasps> into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. Listen to me. Where did that come from? Does anybody know where that came from? Where did it come from? Psalm 40, verse 7. He said, I, come to, I delight to do thy will. It is in my heart. Now it's in us. How does that happen? A new covenant I will make with them. Am I reading this or is it just saying that? <laughs> that this is how I did it. Um, in verse 17, in their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. All right. So um, notice it says, by which will, in verse, uh, what was it, 10? By which will we are sanctified. All right. Now, how do we read that? Well, I'll tell you how I read it for years. I don't know how you read it. I've read by the will of God, by which will, by the will of God, or by, you know, something like that, you know? But it's saying by, his, by this choice that he made to be pierced so that he could gain us. That's the will. By this will, the, this willing decision. So, let's see. 
um, by which will. Now notice how similar this is to Exodus 21. Jesus chose, and I've got in parenthesis, by which will. Jesus chose to change the way God, God's will is approached from that of subservient obedience to that of love and delight, and it was initiated at the cross the day that he was pierced. Well, we know it was initiated at the cross, but if you look at it from Exodus 21, the will there isn't just God, you know, God saying, by my will being fulfilled by Jesus walking the earth or something. It is a specific will where he made us one with him, okay? Um, and he not only made us one with him, but he changed the method by which we would serve God from law and obedience to oneness with Christ through uh, him writing this on our hearts because it's on his heart, and his heart is our heart. <laughs> uh, all that happened the day he was pierced. At the very same moment we became his bride, at that same moment that he did this and changed the Methodist method, we became his bride or one with him. It is as if Jesus gave up the individual body that he had under the law and took up the new body, the body of Christ. By this choice, by which will, by this choice for oneness, though pierced, we are sanctified by that union and by our embrace of his new approach, which did not exist before. I mean, it's just, to me, you know, you all have heard me teach on Exodus 21 before, haven't you? This just blew my mind. I don't know if you're even getting this. This just blew my mind because it is more specific and clear than even Hebrews 10. Yeah. He's explaining it a huge problem because they're all in captivity because they weren't anything like Jesus. They're exactly the opposite. They have been everything Jesus is not. So they're all in captivity. They're like, this is over. And the Lord said to Jeremiah, no, I have a way of actually right. bringing you in. And is, this is how I'm going to do it. So he's really tying all of Israel's history in an amazing way into the cross based on what you're sharing right here. It's yeah. huge. Right? I, I don't know if this is right too, but... Little uh, to me, uh, my ear has not opened. I mean, maybe for us as his body to say, like, in the revelation of Christ, my ear is open. The sun in me is doing the light of the water and the has changed. I mean, I know that's not the first order, but your ear gets opened at the revelation of Christ and you go, it's the sun doing the pleasure through me. I'm his body. And there's, a, there's a change in that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's really what the whole thing is. We just see somebody getting their Well, that happens all the time in our culture. That's no big deal. But this was the change of the whole system right here, prefigured in this relationship with this slave. <clears throat> all right. Verses 11 and 12. Let me just comment on that. These verses are given to reiterate the futility of the old method and the finishing effect that the second method brought about. I don't want to read them right now because they're just that. They'll get you confused in the, in the sense of uh, God's got a train, and, uh, and right here he doesn't get off the train, but what he's just doing is taking the time to reiterate those things so that you can see by one offering, he did this, he settled it, he chained, he took care of all the sins under the old covenant, he also put it away, you know, what does it say, uh, he takes take it away the first and to establish the second. Then verses uh, 14 through 17, these verses catch back up to the line that the writer started at verse 5. So, um, Verse 14, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also is a witness to us. The Holy Spirit. Why would, of all the parts of the Godhead, why would it mention that the Holy Spirit is a test, given testimony to this? Very, very specifically why. All right, so let me just read this. Um, 
Verse 14 presses the fact that the result of his being pierced is the way we have been sanctified and perfected. By one offering, by one piercing, we are joined in oneness with him as his bride forever. Does that sound good to anybody? Sounds sweet. Um, <clears throat> This was only done to us and for us through the means of oneness. No other method. If Jesus didn't initiate, not done. If it wasn't in his heart, not done. <laughs> Praise God. Now can you see verse 5 in, in Psalm 40 where he's going, oh man, he just... The wonders that he's done. I mean, if I read it to you, it would mean a whole lot more right now. But we, we need to try to wrap this up. <clears throat> All right, so uh, verse 11 through 13 show that this was done in part. Listen to this. The verses I didn't read and I didn't comment on are showing that this was done in part by the substitutionary work of Christ, but not confined to it. Now, some of you are new. Some of you may not fully get this, but you, there's a little lesson I need to give right here. And that's the difference between substitution and identification. The key to the concepts are in the words. Substitution is uh, if, if when you were in grade school and you had your teacher and she got sick, somebody new came in, what were they called? A substitute. They substituted in the place of that person. Okay, and all the grief that the classroom caused her, she took it as a substitute. Okay, identification is when you identify with something. You see the difference? Identif substitution is something he did for us. He went to the cross as our substitute. We should have gone. So he did that for us. Didn't require us to be around, didn't require us at all, except to believe that he did it some time ago. Identification requires your identity now. It means that, that whatever he did was great, but you must be identified with him also. So the verses I skipped, and you can read them later on, they're simply substitutionary scriptures. That's all. They're just dealing with the substitutionary side. However, the line that the writer has taken for Hebrews 10 up to this point is primarily identification, that we are the body, we are the bride, we get it because we are identified with him as one. Okay? Does that sort of help? Nicole, does that help a little bit? Okay, good. Um, let's see. So verse 11 through 13 show that this was done in part by the substitutionary work of Christ, but not confined to it. The rest of the passages continue the main line, which is not substitution, but identification. All right, verse 15, and the Holy Spirit also is a witness to us. For after he had said before, this is the covenant that I, so let's stop right there. The reason why the Holy Spirit is mentioned here as the witness is because it is he that has the now present practical job of working this into our lives. The Holy Spirit was sent, was sent after Jesus was glorified. Okay? Uh, what does that mean? After he died on the cross and rose again, Jesus said, look, when I die and rise again, I will go and I'll send him back and then he'll tell you what really happened. Well, we don't need him to come back and tell us what really happened. Uh, these guys came and grabbed you and murdered you and killed you, and that's the end of it. No, there's a little more to it than that, okay? And so that's why he's saying the Holy Spirit, because this is dealing with identification, not substitution. And this must be worked into our lives. We must become that body that was prepared for him. We must become his bride so that we are found as joined to him are all the resources that we think were inheritance 
that he was going to shower big gifts wrapped in pretty bows and everything down to us, we find is not that at all. The inheritance is oneness and all the resource of his life, his nature, his way comes to us as bride, as body, as clearly and fully as it is in him as head and husband. All right, so uh, verse 16, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. All right, so one thing is clear. Why, why is he quoting this? This is the covenant I will make with them after those days. Because the whole line of chapter 10 from verse 1 all the way down has been this line of I will, you know, I will make a new covenant. But this one is not sufficient. Okay? So he hasn't left the path at all. In fact, he's clearly standing right in the middle of it. And the Holy Spirit now has jumped in to bear witness. <laughs> I, I, you know, I will make a, um, this is the covenant I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. Okay, so he's describing that there needs to be a replacement of the old. Am I right or wrong? He's saying there needs to be a replacement of the old. But now he's going to tell you what the new is. And the new is, I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them. So he has said nothing more or nothing different than what he said up here when he said those were offered by the law and there, he takes no pleasure in them. But lo, I come... He taketh away the first, and he will establish the second. So the difference between this, this method and this method is, this, the, between the method one or method two, old covenant and new covenant is, the new covenant is his coming, but not, not in incarnation and not in the air. It is his coming to be pierced so that he can get him a body, so he can get him a bride. And you, you, you check the uh, uh, Exodus 21 example uh, with Hebrews, and Hebrews said, he's prepared me a body. Psalm 40 says, he's opened my ear. Exodus 21 says, you gained a bride. Right? It's all the same story, but the but they're all the same thing. He got pierced. At the same moment he did that, he started a new covenant. And at the same moment he did that, he gained us as his body, as his bride. It all happened, all of it, with one piercing. The cross accomplished all of that. All right, so we're heading for the, we're heading for the gate. I feel like horseback that we're on and he knows we're he knows we're coming home he's fixing to get us to the stall <laughs> uh, and I'm you know if I seem a little excited about this I'm just blessed out of my socks I just love the Lord and I just love that he he this is all true this wasn't this is true before I came along you know this isn't me this isn't my doctrine or my teaching this is the beauty of maybe we'll end with reading that scripture um, verse, uh, let's see. Yeah, verse 16. Uh, this verse is an Old Testament declaration that itself, the old method of servant obedience, would be given up for love obedience. Now, let me make this clear. Servant obedience is the law demanding it. Love obedience is the life of Christ fulfilling it in you because you want to do it. I delight to do thy will. Thy law is written on my heart. That's what it says. And now I have written it on your hearts. That's what it says right here. So uh, for, it's a change. Uh, the old method of servant obedience would be given up for the love obedience. By union with the servant, capital there, servant. By union with the servant who died to make us one, the law is now taken from an external mode to an internal mode. Not out of the mouth of the master to you, but written in your heart because of the servant, capital, that you're now married to. And you're actually his now. <laughs> Praise God. Not only is the mind and will of the one, capitalized one there, 
not only is the mind and the will of the one we are joined to, uh, which is set to do God's will, but he will delight in it. That mind and will in us will find delight. And may I say also ability? Also, he has a nature capable and able to do so, and we do not, and we never will. You know, as long as we're not really one with him, you know, you remember the story. The master gave her to him while he was in servitude. And they had children. And it looked like they were one. But they were not one. And when he got ready to go out on the sabbatical year, they couldn't go with him. Because oneness must take place through death, through the piercing, through the cross. It's not by us going, okay, I, I do. Okay, I mean, I'm just being real here. You can, I do it all day long and you're not one. You're one when the piercing takes place. And there's been a death to bring it about. Okay? Um, So that's why I was uh, emphasizing this thing. Um, he has a nature to do so and capable, but we do not. But this joining to such a one is the means whereby we branches might produce the same exact fruit that he does. Oneness. Him in us. We in him. Abide, we abide in him. Stay fixed as one. I mean, that's really all abiding means. People go, what's it mean to abide in Christ? Stay fixed as one. Don't, don't think separate. Don't be divided out. Abide. Stay fixed in your oneness with him. That's what abiding, you know, abide in me and I, I abide in you. Well, his abiding in you is not just him staying fixed in oneness. He puts his life in us. A branch doesn't put its life in the vine. It draws his life into that branch. Okay? But it holds on for dear life. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Holds on for dear life. Um, let's see, I need to read part of this. But this joining to such a one is the means whereby we branches might produce the same exact fruit that he does. Why? Because it is him in us and the writing of this law on our hearts is him in us we now we're just a body I can, I can show you that but I'll probably I think I'm supposed to preach on Sunday morning and I'll show you that then okay and it'll be a different subject and da, 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 but I'll show you that that exact thing there external rules now become written on the inside um, and then I'm just going to, I'm just going to, well, I'm not going to close with this, but I'm going to read this last statement that reemphasizes this, why you don't get tripped up on verses 11 through 13. The reason I'm not emphasizing verses 11 through 13 or 17 through 18 so much is because they are emphasizing the substitutionary side of this, a side that most Christians are overly aware of already. But what I am going to end with is our scripture over in Psalms. And now I'll read verse 5. Uh, well, I'll say, let me read verse 6 and then to refresh you. And then verse 6, sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened, burnt offering and, and sin offerings thou hast not required. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. That's why he said, verse 5, Many, O Lord, my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are toward us, which are toward us, they cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. Isn't that just beautiful? It really is. Uh, for you songwriters, where was it? Let's see. Uh, Sacrifice and offering, thou didst not. 
I would say it like this, sacrifice and offering thou hast not desired. Sacrifice, let's see, an offering thou hast not desired. Burn offerings and sin offerings thou hast not required. You songwriters, it's that. <laughs> There's your line right there. Okay. Did you get anything out of this? Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Um, for some of you, if it's a little confusing, it might be good uh, to go back and listen to. It'd probably be good anyway. For those of you who felt like you got it all, you might be surprised if you went back and found that there was even more. But um, uh, I really think, I really think this. I think that there is something in this example of Exodus 21 and something in connecting that to Hebrews 10 and the explanations that were given tonight that are that can shed light in a better light than all of the angles we might have come from before. I don't know why, I just feel that. I feel, for me, it, it broke. There's more religion in us than we know. You, you wouldn't believe how much religion there is. And it broke the religious view, and it really just brought it into what, you know, th this wasn't a religious act on the part of the, the servant. He just did what he did out of love. And so, um, if nothing else, because only God can show it to you. You know, re-listening to the class isn't going to do that. But if nothing else, just really pray and ask the Holy Spirit who testifies, remember? He's the testifier of this. Ask him to show it to you. And he, it may take years, but it's so blessed and so precious that I think it'll really help you down the road. Father, I just honor the Holy Spirit who is so faithful to lift up Jesus. And Lord, I know my pitiful attempts to lift up Jesus are just so frail, and, uh, but I know that the Holy Spirit is at work here, touching and moving and dealing and I pray that each heart, Father, will at least have sensed that there is treasure that they want to find from you, and they need your help to dig it up. So I ask you, Father, to allow the Holy Spirit to just open the hearts and minds and eyes and ears of each one, feed them, and, and uh, by the opening of their ear or opening of their eyes to your being opened, your ear being opened, that worlds of oneness and of, of this remarkable work that you have done will be made known. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.